Executive Director of the Braxton County Convention and Visitors Bureau, as well as the curator of the Flatwoods Monster Museum, and has assisted film and TV production companies such as Small Town Monsters, the History Channel, and the Travel Channel. Please welcome Andrew Smith. Uh, my name is Andrew Smith, like uh, he just said. I'm the executive director of the Braxton County Convention Visitors Bureau, and for two years, I've been the curator of the uh, Flatwoods Monster Museum that's located on Main Street in Southern West Virginia. Just quickly, I'd like to let you all know, if you want more, inter more information on the Flatwoods Monster and the Flatwoods Monster Museum, you can find us at flatwoodsmonstermuseum.com. Um, or uh, like the uh, museum on Facebook at uh, Flatwoods Monster Museum. Um, and then uh, we have a booth that's down just behind the Mothman statue on the left. If you want to learn any more, I'll be there. First thing I want to start off with is just to sort of, actually all of it's going to be, uh, I'm going to uh, just run down the, the lore of the Flatwoods Monster as well as some of the sort of side tales that have weaved their way into it throughout the years. And I had a really funny little thing I wanted to do too, but I haven't found a good way to put it in, so I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, I kind of have this uh, fantasy to want to be a stand-up comedian, though I don't think I could write any jokes, but I love stand-up. So I used to represent the Flatwoods Monster Museum. I still do, but I used to too. And Mitch Hedberg fans. Anyway, uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so, um, I'm just going to tell this as if you all know nothing about the Flatwoods Monster. You're just learning about it for the first time today. So, uh, if you are very well versed in the Flatwoods Monster, I hope this doesn't bore you. Um, but this all started going back to September 12th, 1952, at about 7 o'clock. On that September day, there were several kids playing on a uh, field next to the um, Flatwoods Elementary School. While they were playing, uh, something shining or a fireball came overhead and appeared to land on a nearby hilltop about a mile away, maybe a half mile away. So the boys, Eddie and Fred May, their friend Neil Nunley, Tommy Heyer and Ronnie Shaver all took off down the road and headed to Bailey Fisher Farm where they felt this thing that they saw landed. On the way, uh, they were passing Eddie and Fred's home where their mother Kathleen and their sister was home. So they ran in and stopped and wanted to tell uh, Kathleen what they were doing and what they'd seen. So she decided she better go with them. A bunch of crazy kids, you know, running up on somebody else's property. She, you know, a reasonable adult better be with them. And then um, in a neighboring house, there was actually a cousin of uh, Kathleen Mays, who was a uh, Army National Guard. Who was in the Army National Guard, and his name was Gene Lemon. So they grabbed him and continued up the road, and then finally to the small pasture field at the Bailey Fisher Farm. And once crossing that field, they get into essentially what is the woods, fairly untamed. They're walking through a path slowly. At this point, it was already getting dark, but being in the, uh, in the forest, it was fairly dark. Um, as they're coming up this hill, they see on the hilltop a pulsing red glowing light. And as far as they was concerned, that shouldn't have been there. So as they're staring at this light, they hear movement to their left in the woods. So once they train their one flashlight into the woods, they see this figure standing over them. Estimate is the, the lowest estimate that came from the witnesses was 10 feet tall. Could be as high as 13 or so feet. This thing appeared to glide toward them with glowing eyes and a red face and a body that was at one time described as sort of 
singularly, like, not solid, but uh, definitely a mass, but that almost appeared to have no color. And then at some time later, uh, there were reports of it possibly being green. So that part's still kind of unclear. So as they see this thing, and they are shining their flashlight on it, it's coming at them, they immediately turn and run in fear, run back down to Kathleen's home, and call in a report to the local sheriff. Now, funny enough, I actually just recently got to interview uh, the lady that answered that phone call. She was 14 at the time, and her father was the jailer at the Braxton County Jail that still sits in the town of Sutton. And she got the call from Kathleen in this area telling her about this monster that they just saw. So then she got the report to her father, who then got it to the sheriff, Robert Carr, and his deputy, Bernal, Bernal Long. But funny enough, they were actually already out on a call near Gasaway, at, uh, in, I believe near the banks of the Elk River, in Gasaway, where there was a report of uh, a downed aircraft. And while they were on location there, they could never find any evidence of it. So, so they got the report of the, this Flatwoods Monster incident. Which, by the way, if you don't know, uh, Gasaway is about 10 miles south of Flatwoods. So they come up, come to Flatwoods by this time. It's at least 10 o'clock or so. So it's very dark. So they get the story from Kathleen May and Jean Lemon and then head on out to the Bailey Fisher Farm. While they were there, it was, of course, like I said, it was dark, and they couldn't really find any evidence of anything. The one exception was there was a, a stench hanging in the air that the witnesses said that they claimed to, um, that they claimed to smell whenever they saw this creature come at them. So the figures, since there wasn't anything that they could see, they would come out and check it the next day. The next day, the only thing that was found was some skid marks in the mud. And as far as they knew or could tell, there hasn't been any vehicle up in that area of the woods. So they just maybe assumed that this must have been left by this creature that they saw. Turned out later, um, a man by the name of Max Locker, who was a local boy at the time, he claims that he drove his 1940 Ford up there after he heard the stories at like midnight to see if he could find anything, but no one's ever sure if, if he was telling the truth or not or, or if he was asked to, to tell that. That's also where it was believed that uh, the um, there was like an oily type substance, a black substance that was found on the ground as well the next day. And uh, it was thought that if Max had gone up there that it could have came from this truck. But again, that was never completely substantiated. Kathleen and the boys, they were interviewed for countless newspaper articles. Kathleen May went to uh, New York City to be interviewed um, for a TV show that was on NBC that was also broadcast as a, a radio show. So if you all ever see the drawing of the Flatwoods Monster, actually that this right here is based on my shirt, um, this was made because she was appearing on that show. So they needed some sort of visual aid. So they sat her down with a police sketch artist, and this was ultimately what they settled on. So this is where this story takes an interesting turn. And up until now, all the eyewitness accounts I've always just taken as more or less as face value. And if you know they didn't see exactly what they thought they saw, uh, there was something about them that was an earnest and an honesty that that you want to think they definitely saw something they couldn't explain. However, on what, what was reported in 1955 by a supposed witness named George Snitowski, he said he had an incident on September 13th, the following night, and the description he gave was somewhere between uh, Ivydale, which is in Clay County, or Sutton, which is in Braxton County, and there's about a 20 mile stretch in between if you're not familiar with the terrain. So what I'd like to do is recount George's story. Uh, this was taken from an interview that was done, like I said, in 1955. 
So according to George, he was driving down this dark stretch of road. Would have been, and then sometime in the evening, I want to say around eight o'clock, nine o'clock, he said he was driving between Cleveland, Ohio, and New York City, New York, and that his path took him through Braxton County. As he was driving through that stretch, he started experiencing um, car trouble. So once he stopped to check out his car, he couldn't get it to turn back on again. So he's outside with the hood lifted up. And as he's out there messing with his vehicle, a strong odor starts to fill the area. Um, he described it as sulfuric in nature. So as he's sort of standing there breathing in this um, stench, a bright light appears in the woods near the road that he described as like a soft, velvety, uh, violet light. So he goes to investigate it, and as he gets closer, he experiences what he described as pins and needles feelings all over his body, almost like a light sense of electrocution. And then immediately onset of severe nausea, severe, severe nausea, which caused him to puke. I believe his account said five times between where he was and his car. So since this was, he was having such an adverse effect, he was starting to come back to his car. But as he did, his wife Edith started screaming. So as he's trying to figure out what she's screaming about, she ends up gesturing behind him and he looks and there's a figure to his rear that again, he describes as being about 10 feet tall. So he runs in the car, grabs Edith, puts her in the back of the, of the car on the floor, as well as with their infant son that was riding with him at the time. And as they're cowering in the back, George pokes his head up out the back to look through the window to see what they can find. And this figure is standing in front of the car, touching the hood of his car, appearing to almost to, uh, you know, to investigate what the car is. So shortly after that, the creature goes back into the woods. This light that's in the woods lifts off and then shoots out of sight. Right after that, George says he tries his engine again and it would start. So he started and kept driving and then said that he, he kept driving till he got into Sutton where he found an all night diner where he and his, his wife and, uh, and baby sat down for a meal. And then they found a hotel for the night. As the curator of the Flatwoods Monster Museum, I tend not to try to take a hard line stance on any of this stuff. Mainly because a lot of the people that come in, they have their own views. I'm not interested in skewing their views. Um, and I'm just really interested in having the people that come visit us have the experience and leave with the, you know, leave with the story that they want. However, while I was getting ready to tell you all about the Flatwoods Monster today, it actually forced me to kind of come up with where I stand on all of this. And uh, though I feel rather strongly that the original witnesses on September 12th did experience something that they cannot explain, this does not sit well with me. And I want to tell you a little bit why. If you're not familiar with this stretch of road that George was talking about, virtually all of Route 4 in West Virginia rides along uh, the Elk River. And if you read his account, not once does he mention the river. And it's very prominent um, as, you're, as you're coming along the road. I mean, it's literally, if you're driving north, it is right here all the time. So it's not mentioned once. Two, the lack of specificity as to location has set has always set well not well with me. But even now, it continues to not set well. It's almost as if someone looked at a map, found a general area, found two towns with dots, and said somewhere between here and here. And I also wonder if you know, two to three years is a long time between the September 12th incident 
and then when this is reported. So that's plenty of time to cook up a story. And if you look at the, um, the elements of Georgia's story, it's very similar to what happened on the 12th, which that's something I may have glossed over a little bit. On the 12th, you know, they experienced a, a smell lingering in the air, and they also experienced nausea as a result of that smell, and as possibly just being upset. Um, however, Georgia's symptoms are like at least 10 times worse. So I almost read his account as like a, a punch up. Like somebody writes a script and then they give it to another guy to make it better. If they took the September 12th incident and made a September 13th incident that you could really make a movie of. And then also, since he was a non-local, his character is you know, and a character, um, you know, precedent that he had, you know, garnered was completely unknown. So whether or not this is a person that was, uh, you know, likely to tell a tale is completely unknown. So that part can't cooperate either. However, there is one thing that gives me pause with this story, and this is a very interesting wrinkle that may or not have zero basis in reality. But it's very interesting, and I love telling you. So I hope you guys enjoy the story like I did. So um, it's known around my area that I'm the curator of the Flatwoods Monster Museum. So this uh, gal that I go to church with said, you know, you do stuff with that Flatwoods Monster, right? I said, yeah. I said, yeah, my brother saw that. I thought, I've read all the articles and stuff, and I don't think you're a May or a Lemon or a Snitowski. So I said, what's your brother's name? And she tells me. So I said, is this something that anybody knows? And she said, oh, I don't know. You know, his friends and family know, but I, I don't know. So what do you think you can give me this phone number so I can call him? She said, oh, yeah, sure. So... I call this gentleman, who's, who I have to remain like nameless. He asked me to, to do that for him. He was telling me about in two, the year 2000, when he first bought Frank Faschino's book that's about the Flatwoods Monster. Uh, he bought it just to read it, because it was about you know where he's from. I don't He doesn't live in the Braxton County area now. Um, so he's reading this book and just taking it in. Well, if you read what Frank wrote, um, he assumes that Snitowski's incident, incident took place at Franktown. So if you, if you do a little digging online for the Flatwoods Monster, you might find a reference to Franktown Monster or Franktown Incident. And I've never been able to exactly figure out why he drew this connection as far as its precise location because there's nothing in Snitowski's interview that pinpoints that at all. Well, I'm beginning to think that if this sighting took place, that it didn't happen at Franktown, but in Strange Creek, which is just a few miles upriver. So, this gentleman I was talking about, he's reading Frank's book. He's getting to the part that has to do with the Franktown monster of the Franktown incident, rather. Well, he gets to the illustration that Frank drew based on George's description. He said as he's holding the book and sees the picture, he dropped the book. And it was just frozen. Because it all of a sudden rushed back to him that he had seen that before. The monster that Frank drew in his book was something he saw in his childhood. Up to that moment, he had completely forgotten about it, possibly suppressed it. So, he just sort of sat and thought, and all of these memories came rushing back to him. And uh, they really disturbed him. So I want to tell you those memories now. So as far as he can figure out, and around September 12, 1952, he would have been three years old. He has a recollection of waking up in the middle of the night 
walking around his bedroom at, at dark and having to glance out his window and see this monster that Frank drew and illustrated crossing his lawn at Strange Creek. It scared him beyond belief. He ran out into his house, ran all over his house, trying to see if there was somebody awake. But everybody's door was shut as they were sleeping, and he knew that if he were to bother anybody, he was one of the youngest in his family. So whether brothers and sisters, parents, he was going to get in trouble. So rather than wake anybody, he went back into his bedroom cautiously, looked outside, what he saw was gone. He lay back in his bed, got himself calmed down as best he could, and went back to sleep. So this was the incident the best he could recall. He thought about that and thought about it and thought about it. Tried to see if there was anything else he could come up with. Finally, he had just convinced himself that all these memories that he relearned that he must have just made up, but that he better tell somebody about it anyhow. So he talks to his oldest sister and says, let's call her Betsy. Betsy, you're not going to believe me, but i got to tell you this story. So she recount, he recounts his whole story to her. And he said, and she said, that's funny. I remember when you were real little, walking around constantly talking about a monster you saw on our lawn. And we all just assumed you had had a dream or made it up. But you talked about it for weeks. And then finally, at some point you dropped it and we never heard you talk about it again. So, something to think about. The last thing I want to tell you about is a story that actually just came to light just within the last few years. Uh, a woman by the name of Audra Harper, um, who lived in the Heaters area, close to Falls Mill. Um, this would have been, according to what she wrote, um, it would have been predating the September 12th incident, but how much further, we don't know. It doesn't seem like much. But it could have been days, could have been weeks, could have been a couple months. What in the year? So she lived in this very rural area of Braxton County, which it's rural today. 67 years ago, it would have been even more rural. So the road that led to her home was actually quite windy and meandered. You know, it, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, it, it meandered. Yeah, thank you. Um, and it would get rutted really bad. So she and a friend of hers, who uh, was a nearby neighbor, weren't really neighbors, but as close as they could get, um, decided they needed to go to the store at Falls Mill. They didn't have a vehicle, and if they did, they'd probably get stuck in the rut anyway. So rather than drive all the way around, they decided to cut through the woods, as they often did. So they start on their journey, and about, it's, it's about, all total, a two-mile trip. They get about a mile into their trip, and they just exited a cemetery and was going into a holler. As they're walking through it, they notice a what they think is a campfire up on the hill to the right. So they notice and they say, oh, it must be so-and-so, fox chasing. So they keep walking, and at some point they look back at this fire, and it's not a fire, but a glowing, Fireball, not a glowing, floating fireball, just floating in midair. So as they're watching it, it winks out and turns into a tall, dark figure that Audra wrote as possibly being as tall as three times taller than a man. So as they look at this figure, it starts to come at them. Again, similar to the incident happening with the 12th, it seemed to just float but go very quickly and effortlessly. So they started running. As they're running through the woods, they're just running as quick as their feet can carry them. And they keep turning around and looking and the figure continues to always be catching up with them. After they, after they run about a half mile, they get to a fence that they open, shut behind them, continue to run. And at this point, it's right on their tail but whatever this is that they see stops at the fence and never comes any further. So they just continue running, they don't stop. 
So when they get to this store, right beside it, there's also a bar. So they're just doing everything they can to see if they can get a ride back to their home. Uh, they even went, ran around was asking people if they had a gun that they could take back with them. Finally, um, they talked to this gentleman that said that he would walk them back the way they came after he was done being at the store. So they got what they needed and walked back. And as they walked back, they walked back without incident. But Audra never walked that shortcut again for the rest of her life, according to her and her family. Now the reason why this story just recently came to light is because her close family and friends knew this story, but for the most part, it didn't go outside of that. Uh, but her granddaughter knew that, um, that she had written this down. It was sometime in the 60s. Uh, Audra sat down and piped up her account and knew that it was in her effects somewhere. Well, after Audra passed away and they were clearing out her home, they ended up finding them. And I was lucky enough uh, for her granddaughter to bring them to me so that I could scan them and, and sort of have them for posterity. But of course, I gave her back the originals. Um, but it was just an incredible thing to read. And um, it just happened just 10 miles north of Flatwoods. You know, there are some parallels to the Flatwoods Monster story, but then there are some deviations. Um, but a reason why I like to include them into the fold it into the Flatwoods Monster story is I kind of feel like if you allow for enough human error on both, they could possibly be describing the same or same basic thing. If I had enough time, I was also wanting to get a little bit into um, Bashful Billy. I don't know if this is a character you all have heard much about. This was a supposed sighting that took place, again, either on September 12th or very similar to, or, or very near to, in Wheeling. But the accounts that I've been able to find all seem to be rehashes of the same original story with very little detail. So there's not really much to share on that account. And I also want to take this time, too, to thank uh, Jeff uh, Wamsley for the uh, invitation to come and speak and then also to come and bend. Um, and you know, help spread the word about the Flatwoods Monster and, and Braxton County. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, <laughs> that's it. So we've been in it for years, and um, there was a glass display case in the back of the room that was empty. So one day, probably five years ago, I decided that needed to be at the front of the room and we need to put something in it. Um, so I put out a call to some folks to say, hey, does anybody have any Flatwoods Monster stuff? So I actually got collected a few things and put it on display. And then before I knew it, the collection grew to where the whole case was filled up and then I was spilling out on the side. So then kind of in jest, I called it the Flatwoods Monster Mini Museum. Um, so that was out at our old office. And then come October 2017, um, the Convention of Visitors Bureau needed to uh, change the office location. So we were looking around for options and we ended up settling on a really nice, large um, commercial building uh, on Main Street in Sutton. And really the space was so big to, to just have a visitor center would kind of be a waste of space. So there's kind of a visitor center on one side and Flatwoods Monster Museum on the other side. Any other questions? Well. Um, with the CVB, you know, on top of having the, um, the, the museum, we've also, we're the ones that developed the Flatwoods Monster Chairs, so if you guys are familiar with, with those, that was a project that we started. Um, and then also, like, uh, I've been trying to um, nail down as much information, even if it's just a little bit, um, anything I can that has to do with the Flatwoods Monster that's really not been, you know, kind of pulled out yet, mainly because anybody involved with it at this point would be pretty elderly. So like for instance, the lady that would answer the phone, Kathleen May, um, I sat down with her and interviewed her and have that recorded at some point. I need to edit that into something and release that, um, which uh, occasionally I do make um, in, you know, informative videos that have to do with the Flatwoods Monster. When I do, I'll usually publish them on our uh, Facebook page or on our YouTube channel which is just at Braxton WV.
If anybody wanted to get off their phones right now and subscribe to either the Flatwoods Monster Museum Facebook page or at Braxton W on YouTube, I would not be insulted a little bit. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, just stuff like that. So like, um, and I'm also working on in my free time when I can. Um, if anybody's familiar with the the Flatwoods Monster lanterns, they're like a 12 inch tall ceramic lantern. Um, those were made. Um, those were started being made in the very late 60s by a group called the JCs. And they basically did it just as a way to, to fundraise their different civic projects that they were doing, um, which actually at the time they sold those for $5 when they first started making them, which if you scale it up from uh, you know, inflation, it's about $40. So the $28 ticket now is actually still pretty good. Um, but anyhow, I'm actually working on a documentary it should, it, by the time it's all edited together, it should be maybe 25 minutes. So there'll actually be a documentary on the history of the Flatwoods Monster Lantern that I hope to have done before the end of the year. And that will also be published uh, both on the Facebook page and just on YouTube. Um, have you ever had a chance to meet the kids that actually saw the Flatwoods Monster Lantern? Yeah. Um, they were there for the first time. Yeah, I, I do know uh, Freddie May. I know Freddie May pretty well. He is the only one that I know that is both surviving and still in Braxton County. Um, now he's not there most of the time now, but he still has a home there and he's there every so often. Uh, we actually live in the same town in Gasway. Um, like I said, he's not there very often. But yeah, I do, I do occasionally get to see him and talk to him. Uh, and I've broached the subject of the Flatwoods Monster a few times, uh, but in all honesty, he doesn't like discussing it. Um, he would rather talk to me about the weather, he'd rather talk to me about Mona's lawn. Uh, I don't know if it's a combination of maybe years of having it brought up and sort of some sort of ridicule, or just he's tired of it. You know, he was 10 years old when it happened. He's had a lot more life between then and now. He's in the 70s now. Um, so I just think it's something he would rather put past him. Uh, actually, funny, it wasn't too long ago that I was talking to him and uh, actually visiting at his, at his home, and uh, he mentioned uh, paintings. Um, and uh, somehow or another in the conversation, he, you know, he told me about these couple paintings that he had painted. And uh, I said, oh, that's interesting. He's like, would you like to see them? I can go up and get them. So I went up and got them and showed them to me. And they were just paintings of scenery that he'd done. And I said, I mean, they weren't amazing. But they weren't bad. I've seen a lot worse paintings. Um, and uh, I said, Freddie, how have you not painted, you know, rather than you describing what you saw and having somebody else illustrate it, which he's done a few times, why haven't you sat down with a canvas and some paint and painted what you saw? He said, well, now that you think about it, or now that you tell me about it, and ask me about it, I don't know. He said, when I painted, I painted, I believe he told me, in the 70s. He got into it as a hobby for like two years and then never got into it again. So he's just never thought about it. So I've been encouraged him to try to, to do that again before he passes away. He had a heart attack about a year ago and he's been recovering well from it. But, you know, if he doesn't sit down and do it at some point, he might not ever have the opportunity. Anybody else have any other questions? Yes. Oh yeah, well, um, and, I'll, and I'll, I want to also apologize. Um, I feel like whenever I first told the story of, of the 12th that I kind of went through it because I knew there was a lot of other stuff I wanted to get to and I realized I probably devoted like three minutes to it. Probably was not enough time. But uh, yes, the, um, you know, where the authorities were called out and they checked um, that night, they also came back the next day and as far as I know, but this, but this you're just talking about the local sheriff and deputy. So other than sort of going out and just looking, they're not gonna be able to ascertain much. But um, there was a, uh, a, an army, uh, I guess a battalion, whatever, it's a, a, a small outfit from the army dispatched to go check it out within, I believe, 48 hours of the sighting to gather uh, soil samples, uh, and if they found anything unusual to collect it, and um, as far as I know, send that in immediately to Washington, D.C. Um, so if anything was collected and sent in, whatever you know results ever came of that, those did not make it back to Flatwoods. So 
it was either one of two things. One, they found something and they have some kind of evidence and they're keeping it. Or, and I would say this would seem more likely as how I meant, I feel like the government probably is, that they didn't find anything and didn't bother reporting it to anybody. So, but you know, those are the two, two possibilities there. Uh, but outside of that, I think there had been a few other, um, uh, you know, experiments done on the property, but it's been very limited. Um, as you may or may not know, the siting location is um, and has always been private property, but at one time the owner was, you know, rather lax and let people come and check it out and do some investigations, but that is not the case now whatsoever. And this many years past, I don't know that there would be anything to, to dig up anyhow. Yes? It may be it's possible, but um, I'll be honest with you though, I, I per this is just what I personally feel. I, I don't know. I don't know what the truth is, I just know the best as I can figure. But it seems to me that whatever happened on September 12th, and you know, possibly a little bit before with Audra Harper, um, and maybe even, uh, I'll even allow, uh, you know, for the, you know, the possibility of George Smetowski's story to be completely real credible. Um, this appears to be an isolated event. Um, as far as the descriptions that we hear that um, there are things that, that are common threads that go through all three of these accounts that are shared and also very odd and unique, and I've never heard them associated with any other accounts that I know of, particularly locally. Um, locally in our area, I only know of very few sort of strange encounter um, you know, instances, but they've mostly been some UFO aerial phenomenon, but not any other like close encounters. Like I said, other than maybe things that just have never been reported, I don't really know of anything from our area that predates Flatwoods Monster, but I have heard and read of reports that have after it, particularly around the Sutton Lake and the Oak River, for whatever reason, of uh, stories of Bigfoot. But there's only a handful, um, and there's only a few that's been reported. The latest one that I'm personally aware of would be in the late 80s that was seen at a uh, a creek um, coming into um, the Sutton Lake. But like I said, I think those stories are pretty sparse. Uh, and if there are more stories there to be had, they've just not became public yet. And the way actually this one came about was, um, I think I had shared something on our Flatwoods Monster page about something Bigfoot related on the Sutton Lake. That was a, an old story. And a guy commented on that, asking something about or no, um, saying something about that there are Bigfoot on the Sutton Lake. I've seen them. So uh, I uh, referred him to my friend Les O'Dell, who runs uh, West Virginia Cryptid and Strange Experiences, Strange Encounters. West Virginia Cryptids and Strange Encounters, Facebook page. Now he, he runs that page, but he also just, he collects um, any sort of instances of anything weird and wild. So they got together and uh, he reported um, his sighting and that was reported through that Facebook page. So if you all want to follow something, you know, West Virginia based and has to do with, you know, all things strange and paranormal and go bump in the night, follow the West Virginia Cryptid and Strange Encounters Facebook page. Yep. Yeah. Kind of seems that way. Um, I can't give any rhyme or reason for it, um, but there, we seem to have an inordinate amount of these kind of stories that kind of run the gamut. And why that is, I have no idea. But it seems to be. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? We've probably got to wrap up here soon. Yes. I'll I'll, I'll fill them in on that. Okay. So, and and I, I usually omit this from my story whenever I retell the Flatwoods Monster tale. So whenever the Flatwoods Monster story was originally reported in 1952, part of the story was that there was a neighborhood dog that went with them up on the hilltop, and that the dog, being excited and being fast, preceded the, uh, the group, and that it encountered something first and turned around and ran back uh, from the group, and that, that that dog had thrown up at the bottom of the hill and died. I think, I don't know, 
but I think that this was a part of sensational storytelling that was added to it um, at the time. Because according to Freddie May, who was one of the eyewitnesses, in a rare in a interview that he did actually in Small Town Monsters, uh, Flatwoods Monster documentary, The Legacy of Fear, he talked about that that dog that went with him was his dog. And he told me his name, I think it's Skip. And that Skip the dog was fine. Uh, maybe other, other being scared, and that the dog lived, you know, a fairly long, normal life, and it did eventually die, but not, not within a couple days of the sighting. So, according to Freddie, that dog was his dog, and that it didn't die. Go ahead. Oh, well, thank you. I wouldn't have ever. Oh, the address for the museum, right? Okay, not my address. Okay. Uh, so the address for the museum is 208 Main Street in Sutton, West Virginia. Now that's located just about four miles south of Flatwoods, and just so you all kind of know, the reason why it's not in Flatwoods is because Flatwoods is pretty much completely residential. There really isn't a, there isn't really much of a downtown to speak of, and there really isn't a commercial space to speak of. So that's why we set it on uh, Sutton, but it's just a stone's throw away, and you probably won't ever realize you're in another town. Okay, if that's it, we'll wrap it up. If anybody has any other questions, uh, please feel free to, you know, grab me at my booth. Um, you know, don't talk to me all day though. But you know, if you want to talk to me, you can talk to me. Uh, but uh, but I welcome it. I can, but I, I do welcome it. So um, thanks again for coming, and thank you all so much. Um, for coming and listening. I never would have thought the room was going to be this full. So I appreciate it very much.